Okay? Um, so nice to be here again. This week, we're going to talk about the, sub, uh, the subject of the paradox of the novelist. As you may remember, the general title of these lectures are also called the paradox of the novelist. So, in a way, we are now going into heart of the things, and we will explore, identify, go into it more in third and fourth weeks. We hope to see you here again. Last week, we discussed the beginning of a novel, the first leaf on the novel's tree. This initial seed is something writers and readers alike have always enjoyed contemplating, and William Faulkner called it a picture, an idea, a memory. Remember? We also noted that all writers remember and cherish the moment that first seed first materializes in their imagination. And we also noted that all writers remember and cherish the moment that first seed first materializes in their imagination and its evolution over time. Writing a detailed, vivid, substantial description of the first leaf is sure to make for a strong and promising start to any novel. But we still have a long way to go before we can complete the broad, rich, and complex novel we are aspiring to write. I'll admit that my hope is for these lectures to achieve the tone of a conversation with a novelist who is gearing up to write a deep and complicated novel and whose mind is full of leaves and ideas for it. The aim is, the aim is, to, think, uh, the aim is to think out loud about how it might be possible to write profound, elaborate literary novels similar to flawless, magnificent creations of writers like Tolstoy, Mund, and Virginia Woolf, some of whom we have already touched upon, and others whom we will speak of soon. So when I say Tolstoy, Mann, and Virginia Woolf, I'm very subjective. They are my heroes, and I'm gonna talk um, about my heroes, illustrating my ideas from the anecdotes that I have picked up from their biographies from, okay. These problems are always small. Yes. Voilà, c'est juste les canaux sont inversés. Hein. C'est l'anglais français et français anglais. Donc euh, voilà. Donc, what is it? They, they, they have inverted the, the canals for the, for the. Du coup, il faut se mettre sur l'anglais si vous voulez le français. So maybe. Mm -hmm. Désolé. Maybe you could, you could start again. Is okay, really? Okay. okay. Yeah. No problem. Okay. <laughs> okay. I am an archivist, and, and I will talk about being an archivist, and the novelist's desire to archive everything in daily life is a subject that I will go explore even today. Last week, we discussed the beginning of a novel, the first leaf on the novel's tree. The initial seed is something writers and readers alike have always contemplating, and William Faulkner called it a picture, an idea, a memory. I hope you remember. We also noted that all writers remember and cherish the moment that first seed first materializes in their imagination and its evolution over time. Writing a detailed, vivid, substantial description of the first leap is sure to make for a strong and promising start to any novel. That's what we think. But we still have a long way to go before we can contemplate the broad, rich, and complex novel we are aspiring to write. I'll admit that my hope is for these lectures to achieve the tone of a conversation, this tone, with a, a conversation with a novelist who is gearing up to write a deep and complicated novel, and whose mind is full of leaves and ideas for it. The aim is to think out loud about how it might be possible to write profound, elaborate, literary novels similar to flawless, magnificent creations of writers like 
Tolstoy, Mann, Thomas Mann, and Virginia Woolf, some of whom we have already touched upon and others whom we will speak of soon. Faulkner reminded us that the first seed is not just a picture, but an idea too. We link this remark to the many disconsolate Madame Bovary's around the world whose stories of marital infidelity vary according to the norms of the countries, their country's culture. The relationship between those crucial components, the first picture and the first idea, is not just the subject of today's lecture, but also forms the thematic foundation of all of four of these lectures, the first picture and the first idea, or the tension between the picture and the idea in the novelist's mind, point us to the deepest paradox that characterizes the art of the novel. This is what we might call the paradox of the novelist. If a novelist attempts to write a novel based solely on an idea, their book will be quickly lose that element of plausibility, which comes from lived experience. Indeed, what makes novels readable are those true details taken directly from life itself. This also explains why, whenever the well-meaning reader comes across a particularly affecting passage, they will inevitably wonder how much of the, what they are reading is derived up from the author's own experience and how much of it is made up with imagination. If a novelist tries instead to write a novel based solely on a picture, that is to say, on authentic, believable, lucidly imagined, and genuinely lived experiences, their novels will lack a sense of cohesion, of plot and meaning, because life has no meaning except the joy of living it, experiencing it. In fact, as soon as a novelist begins to feel the absence of what we've been calling the idea, they will struggle to come up with the leaves as powerful as the first few vibrant, colorful examples they committed to paper. In summary, when a novelist persists in writing their books as if it were beautifully imagined painting based only on things they have seen, things they have experienced firsthand, their creation will fall short in the realm of ideas or from a structural and compositional perspective. This tends to happen with novels based on autobiographical elements. If I were in a class teaching in a seminar, I would accept, please give an example, please give an example, please give an example in your imagination. As for novels, fueled solely by an idea, by the example set by their predecessors, or by an ethical and political energy, most will end up feeling too educational, too didactic, and inevitably result in disappointment. We might conclude that novelists should be able to solve this dilemma by taking advantage of both sources, image and idea, lived experience and form in equal measure. My own experience as a novelist tells me that this can only happen if the author could somehow picture the whole novel, every leaf and branch, as well as the trunk, at once. But novels, particularly the rich, intricate, beautifully imagined literary novels, which we have set as our target for these lectures, as which we have set as our target for these lectures, are creations that take a long time to write, composed of their authors constantly changing thoughts about both the picture and the idea, as well as of the contradictions they keep encountering in this regard. One extraordinary exception to what I have just suggested, now I am inserting a little um, um, something that doesn't fit my theory. One extraordinary 
exception to what I have suggested and to my view that the creation of a great novel is a slow process involving multiple rewrites is Stendhal's novel, The Shutter House of Parma. As many biographers are fond of repeating and as readers interested in the curiosities of the history of the novel will already know, Stendhal wrote The Shutter House of Parma in exactly 52 days from 4th of November to, uh, to 26th of December in 1838. Many authors who were influenced by this great novel and considered a good example to follow, writers ranging from Balzac, who wrote a long essay about Stendhal's novel, to Tolstoy and to Henry James, must have, just like me, have wondered enviously how it had been possible for their colleague, for Stendhal, to write so great and wonderful a 500-page novel in such a short time. Maybe he was not telling us the truth, you know. The only explanation I can master is to point at the writer's exquisite talent or to suggest that some kind of miracle must have occurred and neither of these interpretations would undermine my reasoning for, uh, so far. Back is so Stendhal's uh, experience of writing that novel in 52 days, it does not kill my theory. Um, it, is, um, um, it is what Hegel would have called um, contingent, that which exists, but with that which doesn't have necessity. Back to that reasoning now. The paradox of uh, the novelist, as I call it, is the impossibility of visualizing, seeing with your mind's eye, visualizing or writing down all at once, both as an idea and as a picture, and with the same power and the right balance maintained throughout every single one of the 10,000 leaves that make up the tree of the novel. This is primarily due to the inherent limitations of human memory and imagination. The more a novelist tries to use ideas to shape their novels and adds leaves for that purpose, the more they will end up feeling that their novel is not as truthful as a picture could be. Conversely, the more, the more sentences they write that read like a picture solely based on pure experience, the more they will feel that their, their novel lacks something in terms of structure and ideas. Ultimately, it is impossible to imagine a novel and all of its leaves, both as a picture and an, as an idea, right from the start. We have arrived then at the subject of the novel and the memory. Before we delve further into this topic, I'm, particu I'm particularly fond of, I mean, let me ask you this, let me ask you this. I do this sometimes in my classes at Columbia University. Now, please try to think about a novel you have read and loved. Maybe I'll give you a second and you close your eyes. You will no doubt remember very little of it. Unless, you, unless you've only just read it, you'll recall of the novel will not add up to more than a handful of pages. When we read a novel for the second time, we will remember many pages we had previously forgotten. <coughs> I'm sorry. For forgotten, and we might not derive the same enjoyment from certain passages as we had the first time round. Most importantly, we will discover that if we hadn't taken the time to read most of the text again, the meaning and novel we had read previously, we would have soon forgotten it altogether. A novelist questioning the meaning of the work they do might dusk, does ask themselves why they bother writing novels to begin with if everyone is going to forget it. If a text is if a text is destined to be forgotten by the vast majority of its readers, 
then why should its details, its dark and convoluted recesses, its veiled references, its internal composition, its ironies and symmetries matter at all? This is, of course, and more importantly, is the problem, and of, or, of course, problem of literature and art. I imagine more prolific writers of popular bestsellers must ask themselves this question too, and perhaps my own honest response to it, it will also shed some light on what I have termed the paradox, or perhaps I should call it the dilemma of the novelist. Let's simplify the matter by separating what I will call the function of the literary novel and its effect upon the reader into two components. One, the first component. One of the functions of the novel is to name, conserve, protect, and enshrine its descriptive passages, our traditions, our cities and countries, the lives we lead, the intricacies of our language. Just as novels connect our daily lives and the people and objects that surround us with wider threads of history, <coughs> of history, religion, ideology, and imagined identities, they are also able to identify and preserve our collective thoughts and plans concerning those various threads. <coughs> I'm sorry, this is going to continue. <coughs> Perhaps like, just like museums then. We visit museums, we examine various objects and items, we understand or fail to understand something, and as soon as we forget most of what we have seen. Yet, the fact that museums exist in the first place, the different objects enclosed in frames and cabinets illuminated from above, preserved and displayed according to this or that logic, the story implied by the connections between the objects, and most importantly, the hollow which seems to form around them simply by virtue of the fact that they are being exhibited inside a museum. All of these things matter to us. All of these details matter to us because they are written in a, mo in a novel or because they are preserved in a museum. Though we might not visit often, the knowledge that the museum continues to be there plays an important role in our emotional landscape. Literary writers are particularly attentive to this museum-like quality in the novel and draw warmth and inspiration from it. <clears throat> the tendency I have noticed in many modernist authors <clears throat> to make lists and inventories, to divulge encyclopedic levels of knowledge, to delve into strange and lesser known subjects, to go off and on tangents and to tell just one more story, or describe just one more detail, can indeed be attributed to the novel form's function as a sort of museum. I wrote articles about novels and museums, so I'm going to this direction now, but I'll stop. <coughs> These various miniatures, ardently and painstakingly gathered, are usually forgotten by the reader. You know, all of these details, reader rarely remembers, or if it's a panorama of immense, gigantic details, we remember one or two. But like, Craftsmen passionate about their craft, novelists refuse to give any of these details, <coughs> subplots, and descriptions up, not because they expect readers to remember them. I'm implying that we wrote, I write novels, I give lists like all many novelists, modernist novelists, but I expect that you don't remember all of them. Not because they expect readers to remember them, <coughs> but they are convinced, like the curators of a museum, museum exhibit, that these things belong there, inside the text of their novel. In other words, we write novels not just so that they can be read, but also in order to put dreams and objects into words, and thus to preserve them for posterity. And we do this 
despite knowing that at times all those details and all those descriptive passages will make our book more difficult to read. In this context, the novelist is just like a museum curator conserving for posterity the pictures in their mind. This desire to pin down and conserve the details of daily life also belongs in that category which Faulkner refers to as the idea. <coughs> Now, the second group. Two, but the function of novels is not limited to, to the meanings implied and the objects recorded and preserved by the text. There is also reading pleasure they bring and the emotions they evoke. To think more clearly about this subject, we must separate the text of a novel from the emotions it engenders. I make this point not because everyone brings their own, often differing emotions to the experience of reading a novel, but to remind us all that novels are powerful, effective, and memorable precisely because of the emotions they awaken. It is a common experience to find that we still hold strong memories of the emotions we felt while reading a particular novel even after we have long forgotten most of its key scenes and passages. <coughs> even when we read a novel for the second time, what tends to impress us most is not the text itself, but those same emotions we experience the first time round. We read our favorite novels again because we want to return to those emotions we also find it difficult to finish a novel that rouses no emotions in us at all. <coughs> what I do learn from the emotions I feel when I'm reading a book, no matter how many candid warnings the author may have given us that the text we are reading is merely a novel, and, mo and then most novelists won't even bother to be so honest, the reader will, stint will the reader will still find themselves identifying with particular characters, growing angry with, or angry with or feeling distant from others, and noting similarities between some of the characters and the people they know in real life. Mostly, though, the reader will find that they cannot help feeling genuinely invested in the joys, the sorrows, the solitudes and the love affairs of the novel's characters. <coughs> the reader will develop these feelings despite never losing sight of the fact that the text they are holding is a novel, a work of fiction, and eventually they will begin to experience the world of the novel as a second world, more colorful and more meaningful than their own, or at any rate, as a cleverer and more complicated version. This second existence, founded on the emotions the novel makes us feel, will eventually come to seem to the reader like a genuine life experience, something that informs and educates them and makes them more open to re-evaluating other people's lives with greater tolerance and understanding. By providing readers with the opportunity to compare their own lives and emotions to the lives and emotions of others, the novel will also create the sense that it's offering us a fragment of life itself, a feeling which can at once excite and fatigue the reader. The novel's greatest gift to the general reader lies not in literary value, the complexity, the richness of its text, but precisely in all of the sensations it evokes. Most people will pick up and read a book in search of these various emotions, and soon, rather than focusing on words and paragraphs before them, no matter how admiring they may be of their subtlety and depth, they will start following these emotions instead wanting and allowing themselves to be swept away by their power, the emotion's power. 
The writer's task is not just to create a text that will awe us with both how realistic, beautiful, and believable it is, but also <coughs> to ensure us they ensure as they devise each new leaf on the novel's tree that they examine the sensations these might evoke in the reader and so arrange them in the manner of an orchestral composer plays, placing one team after another into a meaningful sequence, taking particular care of those moments of transition when emotions begin to soar or to change color and predicting their readers' emotional reactions so as to tweak the structure of their text accordingly. I say all this to emphasize the fact that it isn't necessarily being able to remember the text that makes a novel feel, feel memorable and therefore significant to the, its reader. <coughs> the emotional experience of reading a particular novel, the sensations it evokes, will also determine its status in the social consciousness. Years later, it is the emotions that a reader will remember about a novel, not the text itself. It is through these emotions that we are able to internal, internalize the dilemmas, the choices faced by a novel's protagonists. This quality, this power of identification that novels possess will also change us to some, agree, to some degree. I mean, novels change us. Even if we have forgotten the text completely, the effects of the novel will have altered our soul. The novel will have changed who we are. When we read a good novel, our memory will remember the text and our soul will remember the emotions it brought. Let me return now to the paradox of the novelist. We've said that this paradox arises from the impossibility of the author envisioning every leaf and branch as well as the trunk of the novel before they start writing it. We also noted that this is due to the limits of human imagination and memory. In my view, memory and imagination are closely related. There is a symmetry between a person's ability to remember and imagine things like the visible and invisible parts of a tree above and below the ground. A, per a person with a strong and wide-ranging memory will have a similarly broad and powerful imagination. These are not literary observations, but I cannot help making them. From this starting point around the subjects of memory and imagination, I will now tell you about some of my own habits. When I'm close to finishing a novel, as I'm applying the fine touches dotting the I's and crossing the T's, I usually find that I can remember the book almost in its entirety. <coughs> like many other writers, when my publisher or my editor hands me a copy of my new novel, hot off the press, and before it has even gone to bookshops, I leaf quickly through the pages of this object over which I have labored so for I have labored for so many years and breathe in the scent, the, the scent and ink and paper. But I do not read it. Even a small typing error that somehow been overlooked, remember, my books are published in Turkish first, can be enough to soar my mood. Or a new idea or fresh impulse might come upon me as I turn, these, or turn the pages, and I might find myself filled with regret and thinking, I wish I'd written that passage like this instead. Many a passionate literary novelist has been overcome with, with regret as they browse the pages of their old books. If only they'd written that chapter some other way. If only this, if only that. 
Writers also accumulate regrets because their understanding of literature and of the novel form and the focal points of their imagination are constantly changing. The rise of the novel in the mid-19th century coincided with the serialization of many novels we now consider classics, which thus reach a much broader newspaper reading public. Later, as they gathered all the pieces of their originally serialized novels to prepare them for publication in volume form, <coughs> writers like Dickens, Balzac, and Tolstoy revised their texts with their readers' initial reactions and their own writerly regrets in mind. Returning to the subject of the novel and memory through my own experience, when one of my novels comes off the press in Turkey, and once I picked it up and smelled it and riffed lightly through its pages, I always play a little game. I give my freshly printed novel to a friend and ask them to open a page at random and to read out a sentence, a just a, a random sentence. As soon as they have done so, I can immediately and seamlessly recite the sentence that follows. The next sentence is already like a parrot, I can tell. This game I play, a sort of performance aim, both at myself and at my friends, is a way, is a way to prove to myself that I can still remember every single one of the leaves that make up, that make up my latest novel. This is the moment that I remember the whole 10,000 leaves. The time when the 10,000 leaves that compose the book are most vividly alive in my mind is the moment when my novels comes off the press, not the moment when I started writing it. After that, the details of the novel gradually begin to fade from my memory. Perhaps this is to make room for the next novel I want to write, and for the new leaves it will grow. Or perhaps it is because by then I will have stopped rereading and revising my now published novel. But it is also partly because, like most of my novels, the text is a reminder of my own regrets, my grimmest memories, and the more, for, more painful moments of my life. And I know that the best thing to do is to try and forget it entirely. I will remember my novel once more when I'm going over the draft of its English language translation one or two years after its publication in Turkey. The English translations of my novels are the only ones I am able to review. <clears throat> but when I'm reading my book in this other language and going through the text sentence, the text sentence by sentence, I don't find myself regretfully wishing that I'd written this or that bit a bit differently. My mind is preoccupied with other matters. I ponder the choice of words, I mean the English, the tone, the texture of the translation, trying anxiously to work out whether the rhyme and the music of the prose feel right, and all of this for very little gain. When I started preparing to cover my own novels in the lectures I gave at Columbia University and in seminar, dis and in seminar discussions with my students, I realized that I'd forgotten them almost completely, and so I decided to read them all again before classes began. Recording, uh, um, returning to Snow, or My Name is Red, which I reread in their English translations in preparation for my lessons, I always try to approach the book in my hand as if it were somebody else's work, and rather than the literary regret I've been speaking of, I feel a kind of amazement. Look at all these passages I've forgotten about. I find myself thinking, look at all these hidden details, the emotions, the minuet, and all the differences and nuance and stress, the direct and indirect allusions. Look at all this color, this complexity, these parts that are, that are admittedly a little obscure or difficult to understand. 
as surprised as I am to have managed to forget I wrote all of this myself, I am amazed by this old Orhan from my past, this person whose imagination conceived of all these peripheral meanings, the idiosyncrasies of the text, its dark recesses and indistinct nooks. I had been capable of creating, of imagining, of all of this, only I'd forgotten. And now I'm completely a different person, as I will be tomorrow. And I'm going to come back to this sense of bewilderment around the question of personality and to a writer's amazement with their own work. No one has a personality that stays exactly the same through time. That is why the structure, texture, and atmosphere of our own novels is always and should always be changing. It is also why I am particularly determined for each of my books to be different from the ones that came before it. The complicating factor, the thing which makes it problematical to work on the novel we are in the process of writing, is the fact that our personality and our very soul are changing even in that moment. I am fully aware that this phenomenon is not unique to me. Perhaps the only author who never experienced this difficulty is Dostoevsky. No writer has ever been as creative as he was in developing new ideas to counterbalance those he was exploring in his latest novel. In Dostoevsky's books, every idea and the character who represents it is always confronted or accompanied by another character who embodies a diametrically opposing view. Further, Dostoevsky is also capable of having any one of his characters fiercely express a powerful and wholly convincing idea, only to have its very opposite articulated by exactly the same character and with the same sincerity and persuasive force. What we intuit from Dostoevsky's novels is that the secret and the measure of a novel's depth, depth lies in the text's ability to express both a particular set of ideas and their exact, exact opposites. In summary, in order to be able to visualize or to recall from our memory a novel and all its leaves, we must wait until the novel is finished and ready for publication. <clears throat> Identifying and picturing its first seed or a few of its leaves will not suffice. Faulkner's idea alone is not enough to let us picture all the leaves that have yet had to be imagined and written and whose colors have yet to be decided. I know that the best thing for me to do before I start writing a novel is spend as much time as possible visualizing as many leaves and branches as, as I can as well as the trunk and to record all of my thoughts in a notebook as I go along. Remember that even the greatest writers have drawers full of novels with their eerily, er, with their, I'm um, starting again. Remember that even the greatest writers have drawers full of novels with their early leaves beautifully described and dreamed up in all their cover, colorful glory, but which nonetheless remain unfinished. I'll give examples now. Tolstoy's Decembrists, of which he only ever wrote the first three chapters, is one of the most intriguing examples of such a novel, left incomplete because after he wrote the first few wonderful leaves, the great writer's, the great writer's idea for the book kept shifting. Over the course of his long life, Tolstoy made three attempts to write this novel, The Decembrists, but every single time he failed to complete it. In, in an 1861 letter to Herzen, primarily on the subject of the latest issue of the journal, The Polar Star, which is, 
politics, which Herzen, Herzen <coughs> published in exile in England. Tolstoy mentions his unfinished novels in a very shy way, by the way. You can't imagine how interesting I found all the information about this Decembrist in the Polar Star. He is first flattering Herzen, some 20 years older than him. About four months ago, Tolstoy writes, uh, I began a novel, the hero of which is to be a Decembrist returning from exile. I want to, to have a talk with you about it. They were together in London at the same time, but I didn't manage it, manage to do it. Tolstoy was shy. My Decembrist used to be an enthusiast, a mystic, a Christian, returning to Russia in 1856 with his wife and his son and daughter and applying his stern and somewhat idealized views to the new Russia, post-Crimean Russia where serfdom was nearing its end. Please tell, please tell me what you think about propriety and opportunistness of such a subject. He is, the poor Tolstoy is asking advice from Herzen. Turgenev, says Tolstoy, to whom I read the beginning, because he is at the beginning, he only lost three leaves, like the first chapters, Tolstoy proudly writes to Herzen. I will pause this train of thought for a moment to share a piece of craftsmanlike advice on how to write a novel. One of the smartest things you can do as an aspiring novelist is to read your favorite novelist's detailed biographies, autobiographies, and correspondence. Scholarly essays that look closely, chapter by chapter, at the innumerable changes and indecisions that mark the writing of many great novels also have much to teach the young novelist. Turgenev was indeed correct. The first three chapters of the Decembrists contain all the plot elements, the texture, the texture, the depth of a masterly written Tolstoy novel. Just as in War and Peace, Tolstoy begins with sweeping historical events and a general portrait of the nation, uh, and a general portrait of the nation, to then uh, to then plunge at greater speed into the daily life with all its colors, its vividness, its vitality of a family returning from exile. Let me add, Tolstoy is the master of going from the general picture to the tiniest detail. The reader immediately notices the author's miraculous talent, the ease with which he brings together his two fundamental themes, history and family happiness. Reading about the Decembrist protagonist returning from a 30-year exile and settling into a Moscow hotel run by a Frenchman, we realize that Tolstoy would have created something brilliant no matter what historical subject he decided to turn his hand to. Just as Nabokov observed in Tolstoy's novels, we notice the unique use of time which characterizes his narration, slow moving yet bright and vibrant in its forward flow. We feel the pace of the plot, a unique sense of time and prepare ourselves for that sense of time. Some readers might even wish, as I do, that the novel had never ended. But after writing these first few leaves, only three chapters, Tolstoy abandoned it. He never finished the novel, only three chapters. The reason was that, in the end, he decided that Napoleon's Russian campaign and the Russian people's resistance to his advance was a broader and more appealing subject than the story of the Decembrists. And after conducting some research on the matter, he began two years later to write War and Peace. I would like to introduce another topic that I've been reminded of by this letter to Herzen that Tolstoy sent from Brussels in March 1861. At one point, Tolstoy attempts to refute a charge Herzen 
brought against him in his previous missive. Now I quote Tolstoy, and he is a bit touchy. You tell me I do not know Russia at all, writes Tolstoy touchily. But I know my own Russia, I know the people of Russia, and I observe them through my own lens. Novelist's tendency to look at events through their point of view, painting their own subjective pictures and creating their own leaves has always drawn criticism from those who view novels from the perspective of an idea, from politicians and journalists whose focus is on all the latest political developments. This question is a subcategory of what I have termed the paradox of the novelist. Usually, the more a novelist behaves as an artist, the more, the more criticism they will draw for misrepresenting the general picture, the idea, the ideology. Yet it, is, yet it is precisely because their approach is personal, precisely because they behave as artists that their ideas come to matter at all. Because he's a successful, they ask him political questions, and because he gives artistic answers, they criticize the dilemma, the dilemma of the artist in public scene. Tolstoy would make two further attempts at writing the Decembrists, and in 1878, after he finished and published Anne Karadina, and one in 1901. Every time, the importance of the subject would cause him to hesitate. This feeling was exacerbated and by the fact that he could never find the materials he needed in the state archives or in old court records. Tolstoy read, used to read old court records and state archives to write novels. It's a very common occurrence for authors to write the first few leaves of a book or more only to later modify their idea due to, due to <coughs> concerns about source material, subject, and st structure. Many writers will also change their minds about the novel they are in the process of writing <coughs> because their state of mind, their personality, or their views on life have, ch have changed in the meantime. This does not necessarily mean they will abandon their novels every time, as Tolstoy did with Decembris. Often, a novel will change along with the changing idea. I'll give an example from one of my own novels. In 2014, I published A Strangers in My Mind. It took me five years to write this book. It tells the stories of people migrating from the eastern Anatolian Peninsula to come to live in Istanbul's illegally built ramshackle Gecekondu neighborhoods as they search for work and for a way to make ends meet, all through the experience of a street vendor selling yogurt and wheat-based fermented drink, boza. It's a panoramic novel describing the transformation of Istanbul between 1960s and 2010s through the point of view of many different characters, all poor and working class. Although there are some structural and technical innovations in this polyphonic novel and multiple narrators and characters, the wish to paint a wide range, range in societal portrait supersedes all the different plot lines and pro protagonists. Yet, the first few leaves of this novel were completely different because both the first pictures and the first idea for my novel were different. The yogurt and boza selling protagonist was present in both versions, but that's about it. To explain the way in which that element folk the term the idea kept changing over and over again as I wrote, I will need to tell you about a particular time in my own life. In, in a 2004 interview with a Swiss journalist, 
I made a passing reference to massacre of Armenians in the Ottoman Empire. I lamented the fact that this important matter is impossible to discuss in Turkey, that it has become a taboo subject. After this interview was published in Switzerland in early 2005, this brief remark on the Armenian genocide was reported in every left or right-wing democratic or fascist-leading newspaper in Turkey who overstated, misquoted, exaggerated my words and caused the eruption of a hate campaign against me. Modern Turkish society, much of which was not aware of the massacre of the Armenians, what our elders well, uh, used to call the Armenian deportation, and which, sensing that something bad happened, was not interested in learning about it either, began to harbor so much anger and hate towards me that between the death threats, the people stopping me on the street to start arguments, I, and I didn't have bodyguards then, and the immense pressure from the newspapers campaigning for me to be sued and thus to have me locked up, it soon became impossible for me to continue living in Turkey. So I went to New York and took refuge at Columbia University where I had some connections. As soon as I arrived in New York, I started dreaming of the day I would be able to go back to Turkey and the way my, my way of life used to be. If I did as all of my friends were telling me to do, if I remained patient, kept my, kept my mouth shut, reigned in my anger about political issues, and just said nothing for a while, maybe I would be able to go back to Turkey someday, back to my old happy life. But that day never seemed to come. Maybe the reason was that I could never keep my mouth completely shut that I kept getting sued in Turkey under the pretext that I had made defamatory commands, that more and more of my books were being published in various languages across the world, that I was being awarded new prizes and becoming more famous. Influenced by these experiences and with this fantasy of a return to my old life in mind, I came up with a Kafkaesque idea for a short allegorical novel, a Kafkaesque short allegorical novel was my reaction to all this that was happening to me. My chosen protagonist for this novel was a hardworking, optimistic boza seller who was content his, his lot. His boza had a special consistency appreciated by many customers and he led a happy existence with his wife and daughter. He was like me, as you understand. But one day, for some unknown reason, whose mystery was precisely what would give the novel I had imagined its Kafkaesque flavor, the stray dogs he encountered in one of the neighbors, in one of the neighborhoods, he come across stray dogs, and every day the dogs begin to bark at him, baring their teeth in a menacing fashion, and soon starting attack him outright. The dogs were attacking this poor boza vendor. The dogs who lived in the other neighbors attacked attack the boza seller too, moved by some mysterious and unexplained rage. This my mouse, this my wife, this was my fantasy a reaction, a Kafkaesque novel. All of this happened over the first 50 pages of the book that I was writing. These half fantastical, Half terrifying scenes were great fun to write, and eventually the hapless protagonist, exhausted by the do dog's hostility, stopped working as a street vendor and began, just as I was, to wait for the day he could return to his old life. If he could only find a religious leader who knew what sort of prayers to say, who had some knowledge of these dogs, mysterious rage, and understood of his fear, who could give him a blessing and pray for him, maybe the dogs would stop attacking him. They weren't targeting any of the other boza sellers and the street vendors. Why was he the one the dogs had chosen to ambush and scare? What had he done to deserve this? Maybe someone had put a curse on him 
and he had to find a way to break the curse. The boza seller would try to many ways to escape the situation he had found himself in and return to his old life, appealing to various distinguished figures and local religious and neighborhood leaders for help. That was the original idea for my novel, A Strangest in My Mind. The novel is entirely different. Those of you who had read it would understand. I had eagerly written the scene where my boza seller walked around joyfully and successfully selling his wares and one or two of the scenes in which he got attacked by stray dogs. Meanwhile, I was also writing or trying to write some new scenes or leaves, and most of the time, I didn't like what I wrote. It was difficult to be believable while writing a detailed account in a Kafka Kafkaesque novel about a boza seller being regularly and systematically threatened or attacked by stray, stray dogs every night. I had also begun to ask myself some questions about the boza seller, whom I had named Mevlut. Which neighborhood was my protagonist's house in? What sort of place was Tarlabashi? Who was his wife? How had they met? What did he do during those hours of the day when he wasn't out selling boza? As I slowly wrote the novel and felt displeased with what I was writing, I pondered all these various questions. At the same time, the pressures I had been facing began to ease somehow, and although I was still keeping a low profile, I went back to living in Istanbul. In order to learn the ins and outs of the trade, I started conducting interviews with few boza sellers that still roam the streets of my neighborhood at, at night. Every evening, when the street seller walked past my house calling Boza, I would open my window and call the Boza seller upstairs, just as in my novel. And as he measured half, as he measured half a kilo of Boza, I would invite him to come inside to talk. Eventually, I would work up the courage to say that I was writing something and take my voice recorder out. As I'd often experience, once the people I hand my big microphone to were, pers uh, to were persuaded their lives might become part of an essay or a newspaper interview, they would immediately start chatting away. One of our colleagues was featured in the Sabah newspaper, one boza seller told me, to the question I ask every boza seller, how did you meet your wife? Another gleefully replied, well, sir, we eloped. With these words and with his pride, he wasn't just informing me that he hadn't had an arranged marriage, but effectively declaring that he and his wife had done things differently from what his family, their elders, and the whole of society had expected of them. This story ended up playing a center lawn in my novel. I even went to the villages around Beysehir, where all the boza and yogurt sellers who migrate to Istanbul come from and sought and retired yogurt sellers for interviews. Every new detail I discovered, I immediately incorporated into my plot. At that stage, all of it seemed interesting and wonderful to me. Eventually, the stories I heard in my interviews with these boza and yogurt sellers about Istanbul's first gadget on the neighborhoods, the ordeals the hawkers had to face, the unimaginable lengths to which improvised migrants, migrants had to go in order to survive in the city, the tough lives of street vendors toiling away to stay alive and provide for their families, all began to seem more important than more important than my own fears and political headaches could ever be. Despite my political anxieties, the death threats, and the endless stream of hate directed at me, my life was much more comfortable than, than theirs. Or perhaps I'd got used to my political trouble, problems and to the death threats. I had bodyguards in Istanbul now, and whenever I ventured to the city's distant neighborhoods to research my novel, those bodyguards came with me. As I continued to speak to Istanbul street vendors, I realized, I realized that a whole world was opening up before me. 
the story of Jörg Segler was afraid of stray dogs might still be part of my novel, but in my mind, the importance of that first idea of those early pictures was gradually fading, giving way instead to a panoramic portrait of Istanbul. From a Kafkaesque novel, I returned to a panoramic novel, a social novel. Soon, I started interviewing people involved in many other professions too, from restaurant owners to people who run wedding venues, from cafe managers to electric meter inspectors. I loved talking to these people and getting to know them. When I realized that I couldn't keep up with all this work on my own, I found some students at Boazic University to conduct some interviews for me. By the time I had finished and published my novel, it had turned into a 500-page epic, and the story of the protagonist, Mevlut's fear of dogs, had become just one hundreds of plot lines contained within the text. My story turned about to be five or six leaves in the epic I managed to write. In conclusion, if you're aiming to write a lyrical Kafkaesque novel which relies on fantasy and imagination, I would advise you not to do too much research. Don't try to find out what the situation is like in the real life. What would really happen if the family of a cockroach started hurling apples at it? My second piece of advice is something we can learn from Tolstoy's unfinished novel, The Decembris. When you abandon a novel, when you, when you abandon a novel, you started after writing the first dozen or the first hundred or so leaves, chances are that when you return to it after a long time to try and finish it or even to write it all again from the scratch, you will, not, you will still not be able to complete it. This is because the reasons that cause you to abandon it in the first place will only have strengthened with time. I'm fascinated by the history of unfinished novels, perhaps because I feel we can learn something from these incomplete works, of which there are many examples indeed, about how and why other novels are completed so successfully. Most interesting of all are the novels Flaubert abundant, halfway or never standard in the first place. There are many of these, but the one that interests, that the one that interests me the, um, is a novel that was to be set in a Muslim country in the East. He would later change this to Egypt. I wrote about this plan of Flaubert's in my memoir titled Istanbul. In a letter from 1853, while he was still working on Madame Bovary, he wrote that he would turn to this oriental story in 18 months' time. In another, in another letter, Read, written in 1868, we read that he, Flaubert, is still thinking and dreaming about this novel and making notes for it, and he also mentions a title, Harel Bey. Flaubert thought about the no novel, uh, uh, he called it Harel Bey. We never know whether he even started it. And he also mentioned, yeah, yet still he didn't write it. In an 1877 letter to a friend, he provides a brief summary of this East-West novel. He has given up all hope of ever writing. Now I quote Flaubert in English. A big book on that is one of my old dreams. I should, write, I should like to write about a civilized man who turns barbarian and a barbarian who becomes civilized to develop this contrast of two worlds ending by mingling with one another. Sometimes I feel that Flaubert's summary of this novel he dreamed about serves not only as an excellent synopsis of my own novel, The White Castle, but could also be said to express the spirit of every single of my own novels. Of course, I would, I would never use some of the inappropriate terms you know, he said barbarian, that Flaubert uses. But I have often wondered what sort of a book would have come out if Flaubert had gone ahead and written Harel Bey. For another novelist to be able to picture this, they would have to identify with Flaubert himself, just as they identify with characters in their own novels. 
Next week, I will try to identify with Virginia Woolf and talk about how to develop characters. Now, I will answer your questions with the help of William Marks. <laughs>